Hello, this webinar is titled Spring into Therapeutic Plant Programming. I'm Leslie Fleming, Registered Horticultural Therapist. Thank you for joining us. This webinar was developed as part of the Nova Scotia Horticulture for Health Network's 2021 webinar series, and it can be viewed on the YouTube channel listed here. And we also encourage you to take a look at the network Facebook page. Okay, so you're interested in implementing a therapeutic plant program. And one of the important things is that it requires strong organizational and planning skills. When the focus of programming has a plant-based theme, understanding and planning the critical components are essential to effective services, not unlike other programming. Planning human and plant resources, including grant proposals and funding for programs, along with recruitment of participants and volunteers and vertical programming, by that I mean garden design, plant selection and therapeutic or recreational plant-based activity, well, it can be challenging. Strategic planning for implementing therapeutic plant programming will be covered in this session, including overview of the planning process, human resources for this type of programming, implementation of a plant-based program and funding. Not as comprehensive as horticultural therapy courses, which are available on plant-based programming, today's webinar will introduce some of the key concepts. You may want to consider horticultural therapy or recreation courses, some online, and I've listed them here, Mitchell Hewson's course titled Horticulturist Therapy, or University of Florida's HT courses linked here. And they go into more detail on creating programs, on writing objectives and goals, how to conduct sessions, choosing activities, selection of the best methods, evaluation of programs and individual outcomes, and really the full range of programming use plant activities. Therapeutic horticulture, vocational horticulture, and horticultural therapy programs. One positive of COVID, there are more educational offerings online. New York Botanical Garden offers quite a range of courses on therapeutic plant programming, and you see them listed here. Activity analysis, HT for youth with disabilities, fundamentals of gardening, and a few more. So what do we mean using the term therapeutic plant programming? And I'd like to start off with the definition of therapeutic horticulture defined by the Canadian Horticultural Therapy Association. It is the purposeful use of plants and plant related activities to promote health and wellness for an individual or group. A therapeutic horticulture leader is trained to use horticulture to promote well-being. Goals and outcomes for individuals are not clinically documented as they are in horticultural therapy. The American Horticultural Therapy Association's definition is quite similar to this, although it provides a little bit more detail. Several different modalities might be used for this type of programming, depending on the needs of the participant and the training the leader has. Recreation programming, therapeutic horticulture, or therapeutic recreation, horticultural therapy, nature-based therapy, counseling, and wilderness therapy, to name a few. And the lens through which I offer ideas is from that of a registered horticultural therapist, relying on and acknowledging the principles and practices of established therapeutic disciplines and evidence-based research on people-plant interactions. But really, regardless of discipline or modality, therapeutic plant activities involve identifying a health challenge, setting a goal, selecting an activity that can address, manage, or improve the health challenge, and evaluation of the session and the progress of the participants, the latter as a measurable goal. And I have to say more than the vague, ooh, this session, gardening is good. Use this prompt, which will guide you in focusing on these key components. Note that therapeutic plant programs may not be doing clinical assessments 
or charting outcomes that are required by horticultural therapy, but the concepts remain. These are the principles of therapeutic interventions. And if you're able to answer what is the challenge, what is the plant activity intervention, and what is that, the measurable outcome, then you are using a therapeutic framework for the program and you're on the right path. Therapeutic plant-based activities seek to improve the individual's or group's health and well-being. And these can be small improvements or long-term significant health improvements, including such things as healthier lifestyle, improved range of motion, ability to cooperate in group setting, coping with stress or grief. Programs may be a one-time session or multi-sessions depending on the client's needs. Therapeutic plant programming involves several facets which may be incorporated into services like hands-on plant activities, a garden setting or other plant-rich environments, adaptive gardening tools and techniques, nature activities perhaps, and accessible garden features to name the primary ones. Therapeutic plant programming options really are diverse and flexible, ranging from wellness activities, after school activities, all the way to treatment interventions for people experiencing trauma, perhaps mental health challenges, dementia, food insecurity, and all programs use hands-on plant activities. Programming may occur in a variety of settings, schools, treatment centers, community gardens, seniors facilities, jails, botanical gardens, and others. Okay, so step one is the planning process. Planning really is the key to success for you and the people you're working with. Now, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, as in this case, a medicine wheel garden. <laughs> Look around at other programs and communities for programs that are successful with the populations and people you want to serve. Examples, many with great descriptions about their programming are available online. And you see listed here, Nourish Nova Scotia. They have a wonderful school garden program. Homewood Health Center in Guelph, Ontario has a horticultural therapy program or therapeutic horticulture program for people with mental health challenges. And the third example I've included is Ottawa's Veterans Facility delivering therapeutic horticulture activities. So do some research, talk to people, ask participants also what they might like. The planning process begins with identifying the key pieces of a therapeutic plant-based program. And let's start with participants. What are the needs in your community and who are the participants or populations the programming intends to serve? This is usually the starting point. So what are the number of people you expect to provide programming for? Focus on meeting demand and creating goals that address an existing issue. Then consider horizontal programming considerations for serving the client group. One of the challenges much of the planning for delivering a program needs to be done before any materials or people or partnerships are actually finalized. All the pieces are planned concurrently and this is often a real balancing act. How can you make decisions without knowing where the program might take place? So this is a bit of a leap of faith or rather part of the planning process and confidence in your own abilities as well as knowledge of community need and perhaps an already established relationship with a community organization who will act as host. Now, all of this takes time. <clears throat> Excuse me, many programs are planned over a period of time, a half year, sometimes a year, particularly if the programming is dependent on the outdoor growing season. So the next factor is type of program. Establishing the goal of the program based on client need relates to different types of therapeutic horticulture programs. And that might be a wellness program, it could be a vocational horticulture program, or group sessions for therapeutic programs based in a garden setting. That might be the starting point. 
also individual horticultural therapy treatment, perhaps at a treatment or residential or hospital facility. For example, this photo is an indoor living wall system at Alice and Herbert Sachs Therapeutic Conservatory at a physical and cognitive rehab center in Philadelphia. So they know who their client group is, and that was the starting point for the development of the program. Next key piece is the delivery site. Where can the program be delivered? Is it indoors or outdoors? What other factors need to be considered like COVID protocols, hardscaping requirements like raised beds or accessible garden paths, or partnerships with a facility or social service agency, which may or may not have appropriate on-site facilities, in which case there's a need for a delivery site, perhaps at a community garden. The delivery site needs to establish a therapeutic site one where participants will feel and be safe, have easy access, and include basic elements of water, shelter from bad weather, washroom access. That one is often overlooked. Okay, next factor is frequency. What is the scope of the program? The basic numbers and how often will the group be participating in the therapeutic programming determined really by their health challenges and or budget. Will it take time to find participants? We need to take that into account. And will the facility space be available? I would like to add to this subset the type of program and the nature of activities will be important for determining the frequency of the therapeutic program. And here are a few examples. A greenhouse location with vocational focus for people with developmental delays may necessitate a different frequency than weekly program for, say, seniors in their uh, residential facility garden or perhaps they do programming in an indoor location, depending on the weather. And this, these would be different than monthly sessions at a federal corrections facility wanting to establish a food garden. Next key piece is materials. Beginning with garden beds or containers and planning for plants and soil, equipment, safety materials like masks and gloves and even paper products or craft supplies. And all of these are based on activities expected and planned to be delivered. Much of the estimated materials are based on anticipated frequency and size of program, the delivery site, the available budget, and the selection of activities. These all get pieced together and expect to make changes particularly to your budget. Next piece is human resources, and these need to be planned out. These are often the most expensive component of a program. So make some decisions about the size and nature of the therapeutic plant program, then an estimate of required human resources can be established. Now, this includes finding key people to deliver the therapeutic program, perhaps a recreation or horticultural therapist is required with um, appropriate credentials or not, and also include people to maintain the garden space, people to provide security if that's appropriate, people to do some documentation or paperwork. I might say the division of labor can be important and keep in mind that we need to include time for planning and material sourcing. Okay, seasonality. This is another factor important to consider during the planning stage. Can the program be year round? Is the garden limited to a few seasons? Can you do the program indoors as well as outdoors? Plan for the phases also of a garden. That would be prepping in the spring, ordering seeds, rain on program day, harvesting time and manpower needs. Is it too sunny or too hot for the fragile population you might be working with? So run through the possibilities and ask other program staff what they do in such scenarios. Budgeting, hmm, developing a budget. It requires essential elements to be determined. That includes frequency, numbers, site costs, materials, and wages. Plug in some numbers and then fiddle. 
expand or contract your budget based on numbers or cost of plants, types of activities. Now, budgeting can also identify expenses and income and the viability of a project if this is a concern. For example, nonprofits may not need a positive income from the program to be implemented. If a private practitioner is setting up a program, that's not the case. So these factors also need to be considered. Okay, big question. How will the initial program be funded? Seed funding, as they say. Is there a fee for service for organizations or participants? What is the budget for startup, for maintenance, and for staffing? Now, I'm going to share a bit more information on funding sources in a minute, but these would be the basic questions you would be asking as you work on your budget. So, if you are not overwhelmed at this point, but want a challenge where many variables are in play at once, and you are passionate about delivering plant-based therapeutic programming, bravo, because starting and maintaining any type of program, well, it's hard work. Using a chart, especially if you're planning for several cohorts or populations, or future program expansion can assist in the planning. And you can see on the slide here, these are the factors that I've just addressed. I'd like to share a few more practical comments related to the planning phase for therapeutic plant programming. Number one, start a program, starting a program can be made easier if you're working with an organization that delivers other types of programming or an organization that has a budget for new programming. And think of your uh, role as the specialist with horticulture knowledge, offering a great effective strategy for improving health through hands-on plant activity. So be prepared with your elevator speech or a sales pitch, focusing on health benefits of the therapeutic plant programming. Keep in mind that programming doesn't have to be in a garden. Many therapeutic horticulture, horticultural therapy programs are delivered as, in quotation marks, tabletop programming, that is inside. This gives much more flexibility in many of the decisions mentioned in the planning phase. But I would say that preference is always for doing programs in a garden setting. But we work in what we have. And often because of cold weather or even too hot of weather, we do plant programs indoors and outdoors or a hybrid of the two. Okay, moving on to human resources for therapeutic plant programming. You have probably at this point decided on many of the organizational factors for a therapeutic plant-based program. And now you're planning for human resource needs. The starting point is the client group you will be working with. Someone with knowledge and preferably experience working with veterans or at-risk use or substance misuse populations should be involved in the program. And this can be in any number of capacities from being present during sessions, assisting with program delivery, actually delivering the plant intervention, or perhaps liaising with the host organization. And it is preferable to have two deep leadership during the delivery of the program. Depending on the size of the program, there may be a program manager or an HTR or a CTRS who oversees the program, not necessarily delivering the services, but who takes responsibility for it. And this is essential really for quality programming, for adhering to standards of practice, for COVID safety requirements and expenses. Most therapeutic plant programming though is not too heavily layered with administration. People plant programs are delivered by people with a range of expertise, perhaps expertise with a client group or expertise with horticulture activities. So consider your options. Volunteers can also play an important role in the programs, and that could be students or master gardeners, community garden volunteers. But 
the volunteers need to be trained and they need to be held accountable for their actions. And I might add that not all tasks include client interactions or engagement. So look for people committed to the program, the client group, and of course, people who like plants. So moving on to program implementation, an indicator that you are moving closer to actually implementing a program, you are thinking in terms of the program's goals, its priorities, perhaps partnerships and funding. This suggests that the planning phase has been effective in getting you to this point and in setting a realistic starting date, which can be quite difficult. Many experienced program staff suggest starting small, especially when it comes to client group size. Thinking about how the program can grow indicates a clear understanding of programming demands. And that would include new clients or different populations or perhaps more frequent sessions. Safety, it's always a priority. Considering and identifying all possible safety challenges is an important step. Trying to prevent or be prepared for such things. And I'm gonna give you some examples. These are ones that did happen at my program. First one, someone falls. What staff is available to respond? You need to predict that or someone puts something in their mouth. Do I have sufficient supervision as I'm delivering the program? Or disruption among participants occurs, and we see this with um, people living with dementia or um, at-risk youth. I mean, it happens in all types of programs. So how is this going to be handled? Next example, a client doesn't like a plant smell or can't sample fruit, they don't want to. So what have we considered? Options for dealing with this other than, than removing them from the session? And should this have included a prior discussion with staff, re-plant allergies, swallowing issues, um, or issues of that nature? Okay, next factor is the ability to pivot. This is critical for any number of reasons, including, and again, these are examples of what I've experienced. Session is canceled due to scheduling conflict and you're left there with live plants. What do you do? You pivot or the weather is inclement and the location for the session has to be moved. Where would this be moved to? Facility staff doesn't like the activity, though advanced written description, including therapeutic goals, had been given. Take time to explain or address issues like holiday wreath should not be within touching distance for people living with certain stages of dementia. And the solution might be hanging them behind a glass partition at the staff desk so family members can enjoy the creative expression of the participants. Okay, I'm thinking this whole topic should be another webinar mm, for another day. Many horticultural therapy practitioners like to involve participants in the process and the delivery of the program. And this could include things like planning the garden or activity schedule or garden prep activities like tilling and seeding and harvesting. Now, this may be dictated by the client group. For example, veterans living in a residence will be invested in their garden if they participate in the garden design. Or incarcerated people who want to garden with specific types of plants, herbs, flowers, or edibles, but not cannabis or hallucinogenic plants, please. And yes, this was something I dealt with. Um, there are many ways to include decision making in an activity, not necessarily in the larger program implementation. So think about this and network with others who might have some good ideas. Selecting the actual hands on plant activities is the most fun for most practitioners. Well, we do love plants after all. So. I suggest developing a program book, either digital or hard copy, where you keep activity ideas and material lists and photos. And trust me on this, you will forget some of the details for activities you may use once a year or every other year. And this becomes a good idea prompter. 
there are many resources available for activities, for starting gardens, for selecting plants that will thrive in your area. And I've identified a few here and on the next slide, and I will put some more at the conclusion of this session. This is a question that I get asked regularly. So a few more resources. These touch on activity planning, activities for specific applications, and deli different delivery mechanisms like plant carts. Now, documenting programs, hmm, that's part of implementing a program. And some people just don't like paperwork. They like working with plants, but it is a necessary component. It's helpful for several reasons. You need to track how many are involved, what activities you're doing, the cost per session. You need to evaluate the activities and the delivery, and this is reliant on some of the documentation. You need to monitor program costs, and this helps to improve program delivery. Or often there's a requirement to report to the funding organization. And how are you going to do this without documentation? as well as public relations, publicity purposes. So photos with photo permissions, of course. Articles help with future funding requests, reports, your resume, and documenting health outcomes. And from the documentation, this is where you get the content. Even if this is not required as it is in horticultural therapy programs, documenting really is important. And this can be a simple anecdotal note about how participants engage recession goals. Mary, for example, was able to pass materials to Joe without verbal cue or conflict, or Sarah shared a memory of roses growing up, or John recovering from stroke used his left hand to pot the sunflower seeds. So there's all different facets to documenting. These examples, of course, are related to client progress. Now, there are a million and one points that could be shared re-implementing a therapeutic plant-based program. And I'd like to give you a few more suggestions. Visit a facility that delivers programs to the client group you will be working with to learn about effective strategies, clients, staff ratio, facility setup and safety protocols. The pictures on this slide are of Camp Hill Veterans Residence Capital Health in Halifax, Nova Scotia, which delivers a recreational program with plant activities in their beautiful accessible garden. And I have visited this site several times. It's beautiful. Next idea, intern with a program before starting your own. So build your knowledge of adaptive gardening or activities, accessibility features, and of course, the client group characteristics. Or practice voice, nonverbal cues, and other parts of program delivery. Here's one I learned the hard way. Where are you setting materials that will be safe and out of reach until required? I was working with people living with dementia, some of whom had a tendency to touch and grab at everything. And so I learned, I kept materials under the table at my feet so I could reach them easily at the right time during this session, but still provide a safe environment. Next idea, network with others to discuss, idea share on all nature of topics from activities to remedies for disruptive clients, not being paid for work, um, the picture here is the original networking group of the Nova Scotia Therapeutic Horticulture Group, which is now called the Nova Scotia Horticulture for Health Network. Next suggestion, protect yourself in a variety of ways. You have liability insurance. Use written agreements or contracts with host organization. Have a second adult present or in the facility if you need assistance. Wear gloves and be aware of germ transmission. And really important, insert joy and fun into the sessions. Share your love of plants. Always be encouraging and kind to participants and to staff. Just a note, there is a two-part webinar on practitioner tips on the Horticulture for Health YouTube channel geared to private contractors that may be helpful. And here are the links. And on to the last section of this webinar, funding. 
Is this saving the best for last? <laughs> if only there was funding for all the great ideas we have. So by now you've gathered that anyone delivering a therapeutic plant program is multi-talented. And this often includes writing grant proposals and certainly doing marketing calls to get a program going. There are two good articles I'm familiar with that I'd like to suggest you read. The Price is Right, Setting the Right HT Fee, that was published in AHTA News Magazine, and Show Me the Money, Grants and Funding Sources, published in Digging in EPUB in 2020. Both these articles were written specifically for therapeutic plant programs. So where do we find funding for therapeutic plant programs? First off, I would look at client group organization, mental health associations, women's shelters, boys and girls clubs, or community garden associations. And do consider local garden clubs. They often have some funding. They like to support plant-based activity. Their funding probably won't fund your whole program, but it may be a nice infusion of some funds. Others I can recommend, and they're listed here on the screen, TD Friends of the Environment Foundation Grants, Tree Canada, Nova Scotia Department and Health and Wellness or Comparable Agency in your community, United Nations of Canada. They have two programs, one Canada Green Corps and the second one Green Spaces or the National Garden Bureau's Therapeutic Garden Grant. They do the, this grant annually. Scott's has a program, GROW. Canadian Parks and Recreation Association has funding, as do Whole Kids Foundation and Fisker's Project Green Thumb. Grant writing. Woo! Read the criteria carefully and stick to the questions asked and photos definitely help with the narrative. Identify measurable outcomes, this is really important. And include your own time preparing the program and funding request. Use market value for facility rental, material cost, wages, and think about fixed cost versus marginal costs and profit if this is a factor. Last point on the screen, um, look at timelines for funding. Do you have to start the program at a certain time to receive the funds? Are the funds paid in arrears after costs have been incurred? And is this a problem? And what reporting is required for the funding? And can you accomplish this? We know how impactful and effective therapeutic plant programs can be. And having the capacity to plan, to implement, and to maintain a program requires a full toolbox of skills in addition to our love of plants. You don't have to do it alone. You can ask for input or help or sponsorship and certainly request for resources. But you do need to be committed and have some background in program delivery an understanding of therapeutic processes, or partner with someone who does have this knowledge and experience. Be persistent, give yourself time to plan. And I would suggest reading up on benefits of gardening, therapeutic horticulture, school gardens, or whatever area you'll be working in. There are so many resources online in addition to networking groups and professional associations and virtual conference sessions, as well as how-to YouTube videos. This work can be very satisfying, so go for it. Okay, a few more resources. And uh, I'd like to say the book pictured on the right was written by a registered horticultural therapist. A few more additional resources. And then some other videos that the Horticulture for Health um, YouTube channel offers, therapeutic programming, gardening and plant activities with people living with dementia and borrowing from laughter therapy to enhance plant-based therapeutic recreation and therapeutic horticulture. The links are there. 
that's my contact information. And I would like to say thank you for listening to this video. And thank you to Amy Davis for contributing to this content.